Are we on? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tsepang uh, Kunkobe. I'm going to talk about uh, exploring the Rust compiler. A bit about me. Uh, I studied electronics formally. It was at a Technicon, but at some point, I actually found software preferable. So I did a career change. Actually, I worked for five years at an electronics company. And also, at some point, I was a Python fan. I used to be quite involved in, in Python software, mainly documentation but I've since switched to Rust. And for work, I am a part of the, a, a small team at a company called Penoptics. What we're building there is a distributed data processing framework and uh, it's written in Rust. We, just for trivia, we actually had one person who gave a Rust talk which two years ago at DevCon, who recently joined us. So yeah, that's, that's it about me. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's get into the main topic of the talk. The major steps of a Rust compilation project. So here I'm talking about the major steps in terms of basically the major transformations that happens. So the first major step is passing. Passing is where you take the source code. Basically, it operates on the source code. And then what the next major step is type checking. You're going to check if your types are actually valid. And there we operate on a representation called the HIR, meaning high level intermediate representation. The next major step is borrow checking. And this is actually what makes Rust unique. So it allows for memory safety basically without using a garbage collector. And that operates on a representation called medium level. That's what MIR stands for, medium level representation. And then the next major step is code generation. And that actually works on a representation called LLVM IR. It's called that because LLVM is, is the part that actually generates the machine code. So those are the major steps. So let's go through them with more finer detail just an overview basically so i'll just read through the steps here so what happens when you build code of course the first step is actually processing your command line arguments so that's your flags and options that's how normally a rust is built using is via the command line and yeah the next step is legsing where you actually convert your text into tokens. Next is you take your tokens, create a structure called AST, abstract syntax, syntax tree. And then next step, what we use the AST for amongst other things is eliminating some code, expanding macros and resolving names. Next is we're gonna take that and create another representation called HIR. By sugar removal there, I mean that there's, there would be conveniences that the Rust compiler gives you, but actually they are sort of, the sort of magic, it is called sugar. So you want to, you want the most simple representation of that. It's yeah, it's called this something, it's called something like syntax convenience, right? And then what happens on the HIR is, there's type inference happening. So type inference is 
is a convenience that allows that allows you to to not have to specify all types all of your types so it's yeah so yeah it allows you to eliminate the type but the compiler can actually determine what type you actually wanted by looking say looking forward into your code and seeing how you actually use that particular veil and then it's going to say oh because you use this particular type it means it means that you elided it you yeah it means that you didn't actually edit but it knows what it is so long as it's not ambiguous if it is ambiguous you're going to get a compiler error and then anyways and then what happens then as well on the hr is type checking so basically it, it checks it checks your types for if they're ignored. what happens there is we're actually going to take your hir and create mir from it so mir is an even simpler representation of your source code and that allows more, more advanced that allows borrow checking so as a historical note uh, borrow checking used to happen on the hir but that actually made certain advanced uh, borrow checking difficult so they had to the compiler team had to create an even simpler representation to make borrow checking easy more easy yeah and then anyways so what the next step there is uh generics are expanded rust rust actually has this feature called traits traits is like it's what it's what allows a uh, actually simple to use uh, simple to use interfaces so it's like similar to say java interfaces so yeah that's the the the, the generics are expanded uh, on the using the mir anyways the, the next step after that is uh, the nlvm ir gets created using the mir mir is low level enough that it's something of a generic representation of what machine code actually gets it gets run and anyways what happens with the LLVM IR is that LLVM is used to, it uses it to create actual machine code. And then the final step is linking, where we, we take the object code to create an executable. So at that second last step there, what happens is that the object object code is created for example it could be say dependencies say your executable depends on a bunch of libraries so what do you want in the end is for that code to be for those libraries to be part of your code could either either be dynamic linking or static linking so yeah linking is basically creating something that the machine can actually execute all right that's that's it on the overview let's talk about uh, that first the processing command line arguments ah uh, there's uh, command line arguments there's actually there's a bunch of them in the compiler and i mean here i just list a few example of when you actually execute the the rust compiler for example you can choose which cp to create the code for that's normally called cross compiling in the case for example where say you're building on linux and you want to run the code on windows or you can also choose to create optimized code the examples that i have in this talk is just deep is not is non-optimized mm. and then yeah for example another thing that you can use the compiler for is you can so much intermediate steps that i'm going to show you as well instead of creating an executable and then 
even debugging the compile itself. For example, maybe say your compile is taking too long and you want to know what steps where where in the compilation pro in the compilation process things are taking long as an example so yeah there's multiple ways that this can this is done uh, yeah multi, multiple ways that you can invoke the compiler but here we are only interested in the most common use we just want to produce an executable so here i just I just wanted to just have an idea of what the actual code looks like on in the compiler itself. And yeah, I built the compiler docs just to explore and learn myself. So go into my browser here. For example, I I wanted to show you this this part. This is actually the main entry point when you run your compiler executable. And yeah, this is this is a documentation system of of Rustix itself called Rust Rustoc. So here, what is happening? This is the main entry point. You'll see as I click that, just to explore the code. I wonder if it's visible to everyone out there. You will see, for example, on the main there, there's a few things that happen. Instant now, for example, is going to be used to actually time the multiple, the various steps as you go through your compilation, but we're not really interested in it now. So you'll see that the main thing that we're interested in there Okay, yeah, then we catch we catch errors and things like that. The main thing we're interested in there is a run compiler. Yes. And where's X created is created from this call. This called nvag OS. Actually, it just reads the command lines that you gave. As you can see, see in this standard library, standard library documentation. This is the Rust standard library. So basically, it creates this data structure. And what it says, it returns the arguments with which this program was started with, normally passed via the command line. And just for curiosity's sake, you can see what it looks like. It's an iterator over the arguments of a process yielding an OS3 value for each argument. Anyways, let's go back. Just, just a bit of exploration. So yeah, back to this. So you pass in the command line, the arguments to your run compile function, and there's con callbacks. I don't know what this does, by the way. And, and then you've, you have this run compiler function which is this this one i highlighted just so you have an idea what's going on and then uh, there we go so you'll see the first argument that they it takes those those command line command line strings that you actually provided it so yeah not just that was just a bit of exploration let's go back to our slides. So yeah, the next stop is uh, Lexing. So Lexing, Lexing yeah, takes your takes it takes your bit of text, your UTF eight basically, and then creates yeah, and creates a creates what is known as tokens. So I think it's a general compiler term. So let's just let, let, let's have a look at this so I can be able to explain this this nicely so you can see what we're talking about. This we're talking about tokens, right? So you have this this type called token kind. An example is a line comment. 
a line comment will be documented here. This is, for example, in, in, in Rust code, you can you can leave your comments like this. When you do comments, it's like forward slash forward slash and then whatever comment. So it's one type of code token. So as it goes through your source code, it's actually going to collect things and then those things are going to be one of these things. That's what then enum is. Enum means one of these things. Each token is one of these things. So it can be a line comment, for example, or it can be a block comment. What does that look like? A block comment is a forward slash star. And then you have white space, for example, identity. I believe identity is actually, say the name. Say if you have code like, like for example, this, this, this would be an identity, pub would be an identity, literal kind would be an identity. And then, then you have literals. Let's see what literals look like. In float char byte string, by string, yeah. Yeah, so much exploration can actually be done here. But anyways, so you also have this type called lifetime. Lifetime is like a is like a special Rust thing where you tell you tell your code how long how long a borrowed value should live. I know I can explain that better. Anyway, so you can have comma dot open parenthesis, close parenthesis, you know that kind of thing. So just to get an idea what this means token kind and then so the function that actually will will create your your tokens is this one called tokenize maybe let me make this bigger tokenize um so as you can see it's just a simple interface so you basically give it your string, your string will be your source code. And then you are going to, you are creating an iterator of tokens. So what the iterator is, it's just like an iterator in Indian language is, is basically what allows you to walk through, through some items. It's even called an item there. And then, yeah, you'll have your whole large item tree there of, of your tokens. That's what Lexin does. And then now you have, uh, what happens is that you, the next step is that you want to create an AST. AST is use, AST is created from tokens. It's called an abstract syntax, syntax tree. So the, the sort of types for this is, is things like your, oh sorry, the individual parts of this tree are known as nodes, right? And then example of nodes, that, that's, that's, that's a typo. Examples of nodes are, for example, struct fields, blocks, function declarations, expressions. So struct field is basically take a struct and it has fields, similar to how they look like in C, C++. And then you have a block type as well, which is, which is, which is anything that is surrounded by, by a curly braces. Function declaration is just a function, and and you have an expression. So to see an, to see what the node type looks like, it's actually referred to with a node ID, basically given numbers. So a node ID is, is, as you can see, it's just a U32. U32 is a is a 32-bit wide integer. 32-bit wide in, integer. So you'll see, as you explore the Rust source code, actually, a lot of things are represented by by small data types because that helps with uh, memory usage. You see, the compiler has a lot of large data structures, and you don't want it to kill kill your memory. Mm, sorry. 
Anyways, so I also wanted to talk about SPAN. SPAN is a, is a data type that allows you to locate. It allows you to locate. It gives you a location of where your code is in your entire source code. As you will see now. So a span, a span will have it's a it's 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 a struct. So you'll see that it has this base or index. So that's like the minimum. Hold on. Uh, this is where where it begins. The index, and then this is, this is its length. This is basically like on the source code itself. See, see for example, this is your source code. It's going to come from here to here. So the base would be this part and your length is the length of this, say, this fresh expansion thing. And context, I don't know what that is. I don't know what context is. Anyways, yeah, just one that. So yeah, span is actually, uh, it's heavy use. What, what, what is good for is that it allows, say, like the later stages. You see, the AST knows where everything's located, but the later representations of your Rust, your Rust could doesn't it it has no information about where your code is other than by using say the span the span tells it and yeah okay so what happens on the ast it's a few things one is code elimination another is expansion and then you have also Name resolution. So Rust test macros. Macros is like basically basically code generation. But we'll have a look now. So starting with code elimination, also called conditional compilation. Starting with an example. Yeah, if if uh, if you are familiar with Rust code a bit you will see that, okay, so basically what happens is this is a function, function called display human, and this is the argument that it accepts. It doesn't, re it doesn't return, it, do it doesn't return a value. Anyway, so what happens there, it's code elimination is an example of this. This is an example of code elimination. So what you are seeing here is that on Windows, I run, I run this, I run this, this expression so what that means is that what that means is that if you are not running if you are not building this code for windows you will this is going to be like this does not exist at all anyways what what this does this is this is on a on a create that i actually wrote on code that i actually wrote it allows for color output on windows terminal elsewhere you don't need you don't need to say this. Yeah, you don't need this this particular command or this particular invocation. And uh, macro expansion. There's a talking about macros. There's a few types. There's a derive a macro. Example of it is when you apply debug implementation to types. So and then there's a function like macro examples being say print line asset eq print line is the main way of printing things to standard out with with rust and then you also have an attribute macro and then you'll see an example of that here's an example of a functional macro uh, so you can use for example this macro for testing and for ensuring ensuring that what you get is what you expected when you're coding things. So yeah, asset, asset and asset, things like asset equal and all of that, uh, yeah, basically for testing and they're just macros. And this is, this is following the code that generated by doing this. Remember macros is like code generation. You'll see it's not very, very pretty. So what happens there? As you can see here, you see, you're asserting that one equals one. 
this is the actual code that gets generated from that because Rust looks at that, generates this, and then evaluates this. Uh, let's not try to understand that now. Let's move on. So another type of macro is called the attribute macro. So you place you place an attribute on top of something, and then codes codes get generated as a result. So here I'm using an example of struct up. Struct up is a is actually a lovely um, a library that that allows a command line interface argument processing. Oof. It's quite a long one. Yeah, CLI processing. So what happens here is you are saying that create this particular, hmm. create, yeah. So what you're saying is that here is that your command line should accept an option, a long option called ignore untracked. And then when you print help, it should print this next bit, basically. And and by the way, Startup actually uses a library called CLAP underneath. And then you'll you'll see in the next slide as we do this, you're going to see this. Uh, the macro gets ex expanded to this. So there you go. You get your clip there, Startup clip. And if you had to write this by hand using clip, this is the kind of code you'd you'd have to write. Mine of the struct of part. So you'll see clip arg with this name, and then it takes a value, no, because it's just a flag, multiple flaws, meaning you can you only accept one of these flags, and then the long option is called ignore uncommitted repos, help, do not include repos that have no commits. So I'd rather write this than this. Anyways, yeah, that's just the digression. And then, yeah, so you get you get to the name resolution part. Name resolution is where same names actually apply to different things. So you don't want conflicts. And yeah, it basically allows for disambiguation. You'll see, for example, here, what happens here is that we are creating a type, a custom type, and then and then we are saying it's a U32. For example, here what happens, here, here what happens is that we're gonna create a binding called X, and then with a type called X, see this type called X, and then another one with a another binding called X with the same type called X. So you see name resolution is going to notice that this is different from this. So there won't be a conflict there. So what else that name resolution does is it does variable shadowing. For example, if I, after this, I can say let Y equals to something else. And it's going to notice that this Y is different from that other Y. So it allows that variable shadow, which is which is cool. And because it also knows knows all the disambiguated names, it can also suggest type of fixes. So Rust is known as one of those like languages that have great error messages. And yeah, another thing, yeah, it's actually lots lots of effort go into that as well as. Say you want to use some method that is provided by a trait is going to give you a suggestion for which trait to import. Remember, traits are used for for doing generics in Rust for interfaces, for abstractions. Okay, as a recap, I've been talking so much now. Okay, as a recap, this is what we've covered so far. So processing CLI flex, lexing, tokenization code elimination, and then uh, let's get to, to the HIR part, right? High level IR. So this is what happens here. There's a bunch of other things, of course, uh, but this is like, you can say pretty much the main things. So there's type inference, there's type checking, and there's trait resolution. 
So type inference here, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier, it's where you don't have to write all the types of the things that you are using because they can be inferred depending on what you are doing with those values later on in your code. Anyways, so just so you can see what the representation of type looks like in Rust. Let's have a look at the documentation. Uh, there's this, there's this enum called type kind. It's actually a type of kind. So these are the few types that are found in, in Rust. Just examples, we have a Boolean type, we have a char type, we have an integer type, I see integer type is actually composed of a few few types. So you have an I size. I size is like sort of machine size. If you are on a 64-bit machine, this is going to be 64. If you are on a 32-bit machine, this I size is going to be 32-bit. It's basically for things where you don't really care about the size. You just want whatever. You don't want to think about the size. It does not matter. For example, an index. An index into an array is going to be an i size because of one thing you don't know how long the array is another thing you don't really care and yeah okay so yeah those are the few integer types this one is is i8 which is like uh i means that what does i mean oh yeah just integer yeah I is just integer. So this is an 8-bit, 16, 32, 64, and 28-bit integer. So that was a, it's a signed integer, yeah. It's a signed integer, and then you have an unsigned integer, which is like, it just mirrors those, except that it's unsigned. So you can see that. And then next, we have float types as well. There's two float types, we have F32, F64, and, you have ADTs, ADTs are the more complex types. So you will see there, let me see, ADT def, sorry, that's the wrong type, that's the wrong type. ADTs normally would, would actually ADTs are just like the complex types, that's your enums. You have your enum, you have your struct and you have your unions that's your edts string types array there's a bunch there's a bunch of types anyways you get the point you get the point let me move on so that's your types so how you want to how to actually look at what your H hir looks like this is the command that you actually run oh, so this is actually what the HR operates on. So I'm going to I'm going to show you a bit of code and then I'm going to show you how it actually looks like once it's a what do you what do you call the thing once it's desugared. Uh, let me just show you there. Okay, so I'm sure that's that's not very visible. Okay, so let's take a bit of code here. Let's let us create a range. So, well, that's your entry point main. So, say you you have a you have a range there zero to three. It's an exclusive range, so it's going to count to zero, one, two. So, what happens there is on the, on on here is that we are converting that to text, adding a new line there and then calling a function display. And on display, what we are doing is we're getting a handle to, to our output STD out, write all of, all of the bytes, all of the bytes on, onto your STD out. And then if there's an error, you're just going to exit the program. So let me just run that command so you can see what it looks like. Let's see main. And then, so that's basically it. That's the 
that's your output 012. So I wanted to show you what, what it looks like when it's actually when it's actually disugared when the magic is removed. So just compare the just compare them. So you see, for example, this part is magically inserted for you. So this is this is a convenience. So this is the kind of things that every pretty much every Rust program are going to need. So you don't want to have them repeat all of that code. For example, there is a prelude. A prelude is going to import, is going to, you see that's a glob import, is going to import particular types that that you will most likely need to use. Okay, let's let's just have a look actually. So you can see what the prelude looks like. This is the prelude contents. Things like uh, clone, things like box, things like string, things like vec. Vec is a fundamental type, pretty much fundamental type. You have result, you have option, all of these things iterate. You don't want to have two std iter when you want to use these types because they are too commonplace. So it's sort of a just a nice. Uh, convenience and then also standard so standard is the standard library pretty much everybody using rust is going to be using the standard library i mean we're going to exclude logical systems like say people who run things on bare metal and then anyways so that's where the magic is you can see this one is just left intact and then you can also see there that you see this this when you say is error what happens there it's replaced by a match a match type uh, a match is is another it's another rust a rust feature that allows like actually very advanced matching it's like switch it's like switch statement very advanced switch statement anyways so so that's actually what it looks like and then you can see there as well this range that i used actually it gets a disugared into this form so you actually have this type that is called the range and you see it starts at zero and it ends at two you see just doing this result in this code and then you you'll see also the for loop the for loop also is done with them with a match statement where you actually have this loop going through that doing the match and then breaking at the end of at the end of your range as you can see option none is break and then continuing on you get you go back to the hood as you see it display then yeah yeah so yeah i just wanted to show you that so this is what hr operates it operates on this and not this and then yeah what hr actually looks like it's actually a massive a massive thing because that's just how things work so let me just show you for example what it would look like you'll see the at the top level you get a type called create so crates are the basic compilation of rust actually so they just call crates and then what do you have there, for example, is going to say, tell you on main RS num uh, line one, this is what it found. All this, all this thing, item ID, HRD, those are like internal representations. Yeah, but yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot to go through. Check that prelude import. That's what we show, we saw then. Yeah, it's quite a big thing. Anyways, so I just that's how you actually look at what the HR does. And then now we get to the mid-level IR. So at some point, your HR, HR gets converted into MIR. And there's an even more simple representation of your HR. And an example of that is that loops are replaced with go-tos. So, so even this is a, is a bit too high level. 
so okay so what happens historically what happens is that they used to okay no i'll talk about that later yeah an example of that is called medium because it sits between hr and ll vmir so what happens on the mirror is the the part that makes rust unique or should i say special that's what happens there is borrow checking and what borrow checking is is that variables so a few things variables cannot be used uninitialized and they cannot be accessed once they are moved and they cannot be moved while they are still borrowed and so that yeah that allows that avoids things like your use after freeze and other memory vulnerabilities this, this is the kind of things that allow us to be memory safe and yeah they cannot be accessed while they are still mutably borrowed so things like your variable or your value should only have one owner a few a few rules like that that's what happens on the mirror so historically what happened is that the borrow checking used to happen on the hir but that was no it actually used to happen on the ast huh. okay i have to verify but uh, yeah it actually made it difficult to, to do some of some advanced things uh, regarding borrow checking anyways so what ha happens also on the mir level is some optimization happens happens there so that we don't give too much stuff to LLVM because LLVM is not very fast and we want to reduce the work that it does. And anyways, what also happens the, on the MIR is that generics are expanded, that's traits. And then... <laughs> The LLM really check what it looks like. This is the command you're going to be running out of time. And yeah, the output is not pretty, but it's a simpler representation, it makes things more easy to perform for borrow checking and yeah, a few things. And then yeah, you have LLVM IR and how you want if you want the output of LLVR, this is the kind of command they're going to run and this is what you're going to get so this is this is quite similar to the assembly you're going to get so lmvm ir is is kind of a generic representation of how mesh how cpus actually execute code at least at least micro code and then so it the the cool thing about it is that it is target independent so you can take the same ir and then you can execute it and then LLVM will know how to execute it on multiple CPUs for multiple CPUs. And how Rust tells it that is you use the dash dash target, and which is actually what we do here. For example, if you want to look at the assembly, assembly of uh, RISC-64 RISC CPU, you're going to use this command. And this is just a snippet of what it look, looks like. Someday when I grow up, I'm going to know how to read it. There was a time when I tried to study it, but yeah, there wasn't very good guides. We could only make sense of very few of the things there. Anyways, uh, and then yeah, the final steps with your code is that LNVM take its IR and, and generates machine code output. And that's in the form of .o files, that's the object files. So what actually, this is not entirely accurate in that. What actually happens is that LLVM is like a library. So what the Rust does, it actually calls into that library to actually generate machine code. So yeah, pretty much that yeah, uses, yeah, it uses this IR, but yeah, calls into, it doesn't actually generate exactly like some files and then those files are processed by LLVM. And then, yeah, linking finally happens where you use whatever linker you have. I suppose the most popular one is binary tools, at least on Linux. And then there's this one for done built by the LLVM team. And then we'll finally have something we can execute. And yeah, that's, that, that's it. And yeah, much of this thanks to the RSC dev guide. 
it's a guide it's a guide that the compiler team built team I'm part of actually to explain the compiler to also help people who want to contribute and learn the compiler look at how everything works and also thanks devcom for <laughs> uh, helping me learn the stuff thank you